And let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke, where we're going to be talking about the parable of the two debtors. You'll remember I've been in a series. Yeah, thank you for the lights. <laughs> uh, I've been in a series uh, concerning the words of Jesus, particularly in the parables which he spoke over and over and over again. That was his favorite way to teach, and that was to tell a story that with, with an earthly understanding that showed you a picture of something important in heaven. Today, he's going to talk to us about the main theme of forgiveness. Years ago, when I was director of missions up in Joplin, uh, I uh, had gone to my home church there at Carl Junction, Missouri, to preach, and while I was there, I had preached that Sunday on forgiveness. Shortly thereafter, I received this letter from a lady in the church. I've come to know her and really appreciate her until her passing, but she said, I'm, uh, I miss your sister. No, excuse me. I, let me turn to the right place. Here we go. Uh, Dear Steve, when you first came here to work with our association, you came to preach for us here one Sunday. Your sermon was on forgiveness. Your sermon was powerful for me. I had been struggling uh, to turn loose of one last piece of a bad time in my life. God had been telling me to write a letter of apology to my brother for three and a half years. Well, you know, I'd rather eat dirt and die. <laughs> God spoke very softly to me during your message. Sue, if you can't do it for your brother, if you can't do it for you, can you do it for me? Well, Steve, I, I just didn't know how to tell God no. You have to understand that those thoughts were not my thoughts, but they came from God. Sometimes your words move through the Spirit, a person to accept Jesus as their Savior, and sometimes to help them or help him bring healing to a tormented soul. She went on to say some personal things about members of my family that she knew, and she said at the end, Oh, did I tell you that my obedience to God in writing that note set me free? Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Steve. Because of him, I am your sister in Christ. And then she signs the letter. You know, we can be slaves to areas where we are not willing to let something go. And let me tell you something about forgiveness. Forgiveness always is costly. Always. Somebody has to pay the price and say, I will forgive. Well, God paid that price for us, didn't he? And so as we look at this parable today, Jesus has been doing several things in this seventh chapter of Luke. And when you get there, there are three miracles in the chapter. The first one was the healing of the centurion's son, uh, and that was a great miracle. And then there was the raising of the widow's son from the dead, and that was a greater miracle. And then there was the greatest miracle of all, and that was forgiving a sinful woman. Now, why is it greatest? Well, it's greatest because it met the greatest need, an eternal need. It was the greatest because it produced the greatest results, a changed life. And it was greatest because it cost the greatest price, God's Son. Looking with me today, let's break into that passage of Scripture at verse 36. And Jesus has been invited to a Pharisee's home, and he goes. And when he goes, something strange takes place. Listen along. Verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw, uh, <clears throat> saw this, he said to himself, if, a ma if this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner." And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. 
A money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When, he was un when they were unable to repay, the gracious he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who, was, who he forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. And turning to the woman, he said to Simon, did you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has, since the, that time that I came in, not ceased to kiss my feet. Did you, not anoint my, or you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. And she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven you. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's quite a story. Now, when we see the idea of forgiveness, we need to understand that's something everyone needs. Some people say, Well, not me. I, I don't have anything to be forgiven for. First thing is that you need to be forgiven for lying. Secondly, you need to be forgiven for pride. There are so many things that you could be forgiven for because you need forgiveness too. I don't care who you are. You might be the poorest person on earth or the richest person on earth. You may be somebody who is unknown or you may be uh, the president of the United States. Everybody needs forgiveness. Everybody. Because you see, the Bible declares it like this. There's none righteous. No, not one. So if you're looking at, at, at life and saying, I'm a pretty good person. I don't need God. I don't need church. I don't need the, the Bible. I don't need, I don't need, I don't need. Guess what? You don't know what your needs are. Because the scripture clearly says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that do good. There are none that seek after God. I call that the four nuns that are in the Bible. Okay. <laughs> I talk to my Catholic friends about that. <laughs> but when we see this, we see that when Jesus is talking about these, or when we see Jesus talking about the forgiveness in this thing, she was a person who was an obvious sinner. Okay. She had the sins of the flesh as a part of her life. Immorality, probably drunkenness. And, <clears throat> and yet, on the other hand, there were people in that room, the Pharisee in particular, who is thinking about this woman and judging her, has a sin of the Spirit. That of hypocrisy and envy and pride and covetousness. And let me tell you something. Both will separate you from God. Whether it's something immoral or whether it's something that's simply in your spirit, both of those are sins that separate us from God. Let me tell you, the Scripture makes it very clear in Isaiah that God, excuse me, God's hand is not so short that he cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that he cannot hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God that he will not hear you. Now notice the will of God is in that. <clears throat> he will not hear you if you will not acknowledge your need for forgiveness and so when we see this happening here some think that because they don't commit some overt sin that they have not committed any sin or no sin has occurred but let me just tell you if you know to do good and you don't do it James 4 17 says to him that man has sinned so there <laughs> we're hemmed in either any way we go because you can commit sins and you can omit and sin. So as you look at this, open sins are things like this woman had. It was obvious. Everyone in town knew it. You, you know people like that. You, you've run into them throughout your life and, and it's real clear. <laughs> you don't have to wonder, is that person a sinner? Yes. Yes, they are. But there is also other kinds of sin in this. There are sins of the thoughts of that man. Look at verse 40. Jesus 
answers his thoughts. Okay? The, the man didn't speak this. The Pharisee did not say this. But it, when it says there that, that when Jesus heard this, he answered him, and he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, well, say on. Say it. Now, he doesn't realize he's already hung. Okay? <laughs> he's already caught in the trap of his own sin. And yet, because he hasn't understood exactly what the comparison of the two, he's exalting the sin of this woman who is an obvious sinner, and he's missing the sin of his own thoughts. And Jesus answers his thoughts. I've seen that many times throughout the ministry of Jesus. People didn't even have to speak it, and he knew what was going on. Guess what? Same thing works with you. You don't have to speak it, and he still knows what's going on in your heart. Now, I'll tell you, it's good to own, it, own up to it and to say, yeah, yeah that's, that's correct, Lord. You, you're, you've got me on that one. But nevertheless, when we see this, some people say, well, I don't feel guilty. Therefore, I must not have sinned. Do you know what? The Bible talks about the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. How much, how much weight does a dead man feel? I mean, if you go to a corpse and you lay five pounds on that corpse, how much does he feel? None. How about a hundred pounds? No, he doesn't feel it. How about a thousand pounds? Doesn't feel it. Why? He's dead. And I'm going to tell you something. When a person says, I don't feel any guilt over sin, it may be because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Let me tell you, when you understand what real sin is, you understand your need for somebody who can forgive you of that sin. So when we see this, in verse 41, it says, A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. So one owes 10 times as much as the other. And he says, and when they came on hard times and couldn't pay, repay it, they were forgiven. And then he simply turns the question back to the Pharisee. And he says, Simon, who do you suppose will love that man more? He says, I suppose he who was get forgiven much. And Jesus said, you got it. You, you answered correctly. Now, folks, let me say to you, ha have you ever met someone who was converted and they had been extremely sinful in their life and their life radically changed and Jesus became the center of everything and they began to love people instead of hate people. They began to forgive people instead of hold back forgiveness. They began to be a person who did things that God wanted them to do when God wanted them to do it. Their life changed. Let me tell you, that's the mark of conversion is that there is really a change. I remember, and I've told you about witnessing to my father before he was converted. Over and over again, he would tell me about a religious experience he'd had when he was like 12 years old. But his life never changed. He never followed the Lord in believers' baptism. Church was not important to him. When I, when I told him that I was called to preach and I was going to be uh, serving the Lord, he said, please do something else. I, don't do that. That was my encouragement from my dad. <laughs> okay? And he said, if you can do anything else, do something else. Now, let me just tell you, when the day came that my father was truly converted, worlds changed. He became a different man. Now, he was still an honorable man in the community. He was still a man who had a lot of respect all of those things are always true, even when he was a lost man. But when he got saved, he humbled himself and really gave himself to Jesus, and his life changed. And I got to see about the last 18 years of his life as a Christian, something I'd prayed for for 30-some years since I'd been converted. And my mom had prayed 20, or well, uh, 10 more years than that because... Uh, they, you know, I was, uh, my dad told her, you know, if you'll, if you'll go to a Baptist church, I'll go with you, because that was his background. But he lied. He didn't go. 
and it wasn't important to him and neither was her faith and neither was my faith and anybody else but there came a time where he understood forgiveness that's what Jesus is trying to get across to Simon, this Pharisee in whose home he is meeting at this time. And when he says to him, Simon, when I entered your house, you didn't wash my feet. You, you didn't give me any anointing for my head. You, you, but this woman, since the moment she came in, she has wept and her tears have wet my feet and with her hair she dried my feet and she took that alabaster box of perfume and she anointed my feet and she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And then Jesus turns to her. He says, woman, your sins are forgiven you. And the last thing he says there in the chapter and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. You know the word that's used there is eternal salvation. The idea that you are forgiven and you will remain forgiven. Now, let me just tell you, when Jesus truly forgives you, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. But if you don't know that forgiveness, you don't know the value of it. Well, remember those two debtors? One owed more than the other. Both were forgiven, Thanks, thank the Lord they were. And you may be someone who, maybe you came early to understand your need of salvation. Or maybe you came to it late in life. After an un unfortunate series of things that had maybe gone on in your life. But whatever the case, if Jesus forgave you, you are forgiven. That's something we need to get a hold of. But if he hasn't forgiven you yet, your sins have separated you from your God. And I don't care what you try to do. If it's turning over a new leaf, being a good person, giving you know, charitably or whatever it might be to try to balance the scales. Can I tell you something? That's not how salvation works. Now, are those bad things? No, I think you ought to clean up your act now and then and turn over a new leaf. Are, are, are they bad things for you to do nice things for people and help others? No, those are not bad things, but they will not find forgiveness for you or anyone else. And so when Jesus shows the provision he's trying to help this man understand just how hopeless he is and how forgiven she is you know the closer we are to God the more likely it is that we will be very aware of having been forgiven the very aware of our sinfulness and need for forgiveness for instance, Abraham considered himself but dust and ashes. Job said, Behold, I am a vile man. Ezra said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush my face uh, to, to seek you. And Isaiah said, uh, I am a sinful man, uh, I a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Peter said, uh, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. Those are some godly people. But the closer you are to God, the more you understand that you needed forgiveness and you got it. That's why when we sing and we can praise and lift our hands and sing, sing glorious songs to the Lord, they're not just words. Oh, no. We're, we're saying, Lord, you did this. It was your work. You see, Paul goes on to write to Titus later on, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, God saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand that it starts with God and it ends with God because God brings the salvation start to finish. And where does it start? Understanding our need for forgiveness. You see... 
when we come to truly believe in God, we place our faith in him. And we begin to, to understand that he has, has done all the work and we've received all the benefit. That's called grace, folks. It, it's not something that, you, that God owed you. It's something God gave you. And so as we look at this whole idea, there's the certainty of forgiveness that we see in this woman when Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And then later he says, your faith has saved you. And as we look at that, the tense of the word used there in the Greek, it means you have for, been forgiven and your sins stand forgiven. Do you know if you go back to God after you've confessed your sin and say, God, you remember that sin I did? No. Don't remember that. I don't know how he does it because I can still remember him. I can still remember those things. But God casts our sin as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against us any longer. I'm sure glad he didn't say north and south. Because if I go north, there's a point where I start going south. If I go south, there's a point where I start going north. But if I go east, there's never a place called west. If I go west, there's never a place called east. And he's taken my sin and cast it there. I want to praise him for that because he is the Almighty. And so as we look today at the forgiveness, there were two debtors. One owed much. And because of the forgiveness he received, he loved much. I want to challenge you today. I want you to look at your own heart and life and just take stock and say, have I truly received forgiveness from God if you have not this is a day where you should respond every time the gospel is preached every person in this place should respond to God now your response may be yes Lord I am that sinner and I need to be forgiven and I would be happy to visit with you about how that you can receive that forgiveness from God I'm gonna be right down here during this last song and I'd be happy to visit with you before, during or after church we have elders who could help you with that. We have staff who can help you with that. But understand, we all need to be responding to God. That's if you need to be forgiven initially. But if you as a child of God have been forgiven, your response might be, Lord, thank you for the reminder. Thank you for helping me take stock again of just how precious your forgiveness truly is. Lord, as we come to this time, we pray that you would speak to our hearts as only you can do. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.